Daniel is a professor of literature and writing at Bethel University in Minnesota and the author of six books, including Tell Me a Story, The Life-Shaping Power of Our Stories, complimentary copies of which are available on our book table. In addition to teaching at the university, he leads workshops on telling life stories and leaving a spiritual legacy as well as other topics. And most importantly, he is a new member of our Board of Governors. Please welcome Daniel Taylor. I am here this morning, as I think many of you are, because of stories. About 25 years ago, I read an Opportunity International mailing and, that was filled with stories of hard work and sacrifice and optimism and success. And importantly, these were not uh, abstractions about hard work, uh, sacrifice, optimism, and success. They were stories with names and settings and places. Uh, they were stories of real people and real lives, and I was drawn in, as we always are when we hear a story being told. And I realized these were stories I wanted to be part of. Um, and this is how stories work. Stories, we don't simply hear stories, but we are absorbed by stories, and stories absorb us. They become part of us. We become literally characters in the stories that we hear. So somebody else's story becomes my story, and the links from story to story reach out to eternity. So in 1985, I had read some of these stories from Opportunity International, and I made a small donation, and I've been making small donations ever since. But without the stories, I, I never would have gotten involved, and I wouldn't be here this morning. And I think probably most of you were drawn in to Opportunity International initially by a story. The theme of this meeting is Share Her Story, Change Your World. And I want to reflect just briefly on why uh, telling her story is the single best way of changing her life for the better, and in the process also changing your own. So I'm going to give you five reasons why you should use story to do the work of Opportunity International, why we do. And then Mark Letts is going to follow with an Opportunity International story from his own uh, experience in the field. But before I give you five abstract reasons, I want to give you a very compressed telling of a story, which I hope will give life to the abstractions. This is a story that's told by a former student of mine who also is a very good friend of my adult daughter. Uh, the two of them, along with some other women, started a mural painting ministry. They went to various places around the world. They would always go to the uh, poorest parts of town and in from one to six weeks would create a public mural on some wall, some public place um, that both involved the local community and in some way or another celebrated the local community. During a trip to South Africa, my daughter's friend Amy was heading up the painting of a 600 foot long mural in a township and the subject of the mural was AIDS and they invited local people to paint candles on the mural in honor of someone who had died of AIDS. Uh, they soon realized they had a problem because so many people had lost a loved one to AIDS that they soon had to make a rule that you could only paint one candle. Well, one day Amy discovered a young woman who had broken the rule. And this is just a very small part of her story that she calls Three Candles. I'll just read you a page. As I rushed toward her, my mission was clear. Stop that young girl from painting more candles. She had already painted three before we had noticed. When I got to her, I nonchalantly sat down next to her on the ground and said, hey, I see you're painting some beautiful candles. Who, the, who are they in honor of? That sounds good, doesn't it? But truthfully, I wasn't interested in her answer. I was interested in stalling while I thought of a good way to tell her that her painting was done for the day. She couldn't have been more than 18. She looked at me, held my gaze unwaveringly, penetrating, then hesitated as if trying to figure out if she could trust me with her answer. Then she spoke. She simply said, the first one is for my husband who died a year ago of AIDS. The second one is for my baby boy who died eight months ago because of AIDS. The last one is for me, because I'm dying, and it won't be long. I want my name on this wall. Thank you for letting me put my name on this wall. 
I felt my heart drop to my ankles. My first thought was of my own failure. Her unwavering gaze still haunts me. She only wanted three candles. She only wanted her name on the wall. One of the things that breaks my heart in this world is knowing that some people have no one to share their stories with. Imagine having no one to fight for you, no one to speak your name into the air. All I know to do is to speak the names of these people, to tell their stories. I will speak for myself. As I've faced death and my mortality, I've realized that I'm just like that South African girl. I want my name on a wall. I'm not naive enough to think that we can go to these people and love the hurt off them, or that we can fix all that is broken. But I do know this. We can write their names on a wall. We can speak their names and tell their stories, redeeming a small part of their painful lives and giving them dignity, one name at a time. We can give them three candles. Well, that's Amy's story. I think it's significant that she says we can give people dignity one name at a time because Mark Lutz shared with me an article by social scientists that investigate what motivates people to give. And they found that people are much more likely to give when they hear the story of a single person in need than, if, than when they hear the story of many people in need. In fact, the effect is diluted, they tell us, when the story includes even a second person in need. There is something especially powerful, especially perhaps in our society, about the story of a single individual who needs help. And for what it's worth, that same social science research indicates that the story of a single girl is the most powerful story of all. So when the organizers of this meeting chose share her story, they probably had more scientific backing than they realized. So why, if we want to help those in need, do we tell stories? This is the uh, five abstractions part. And I'm going to give you five reasons. First, we live in stories, not just hear them. We live in stories, not just hear them. We're born into stories. We're shaped by stories. We inhale and exhale stories. Stories are the air we breathe. Whenever human beings have needed to explain something important to themselves, they've told a story. Whenever we're faced with a conundrum or a challenge or something we don't understand as human beings, we almost always tell a story. Stories are the single best way of preserving memory and explaining the world to ourselves. Furthermore, our lives present themselves to us in story form. We are characters in a story, a story which is interwoven with the stories of others. We are characters in other people's stories, and they are characters in ours. When we share her story, as the title of this meeting suggests, we are also shaping our own. Because once we know her story, she becomes a character in our own story. And if we play a part, become a we become a character in hers. A second reason that story is effective in doing this work is that stories engage all of us, not just part of us. Stories reject any sort of neat division of human beings into intellect and emotion and body. Stories make an in equal and integrated appeal to both reason and emotion and recognize the interdependence of mind, spirit, and body. They also appeal to the imagination and our sense of wonder and to the human will. Uh, just think of any powerful story that you've read, any wonderful movie that you've seen. It doesn't just affect part of who you are, just your mind or just your emotion. It affects you as a whole person, uh, and all good stories do. So anything that engages all of us as opposed to just part of us is going to be more powerful. Thirdly, stories are crucial because stories make connections between things. This is the plot-making aspect of story. We read and listen to stories to find out what happens next. And we do so because we, are inher we inherently believe that what happens next is somehow linked to what has already happened. And without that link, there would be no possibility for meaning in life. Uh, one of the most basic human needs is that life makes some sort of sense. 
that it not just seem random or arbitrary. Stories are the primary ways in which we either discover or create meaning in the world. Stories believe in cause and effect. This happened because that happened. Opportunity International stories are all about cause and effect. Here's a woman in this situation in life with this opportunity to improve her life. If we give her this help, it will have that effect. If we didn't believe in cause and effect, we would never engage in any purposeful action and the world would be a much more frightening and sadder place. We also need to tell stories because stories create communities. Human beings are innately social creatures. Uh, you cannot be fully human by yourself. And stories link us together more powerfully than anything else we have. One definition of a community is people who share common stories. People who share common stories. I think this is true of families. Uh, the glue that holds family together is more shared story than it is shared genetics. But it's also true of nations. It's true of ethnic and religious groups. Of any group that shares core values. Um, it's true of Opportunity International. We are a community because we share some core values and increasingly we share common stories. If we want to overcome many of the divides in the world, we need to share more stories together. Most of the uh, conflicts in the world are story collisions. One group's narrative uh, of their experience colliding with another group's narrative. And the same is true when individuals collide in a marriage or in relationships. We have story collisions. When stories collide, when two stories collide, we need to find a third story, one that includes everyone. When we share international opportunity stories, we are inviting people into a wider sense of community. And in so doing, we are bringing more shalom into the world. Uh, the last reason that telling stories is important, that at least I'm going to touch on today, is that stories encourage us to act. A healthy human being is a verb, not a noun. We must act, not simply exist. Stories encourage us to see ourselves as characters in a story. The essence of being a character is making choices, which is why stories are inescapably value-laden. Every choice implies an ought. I choose to do this and not that because. And in that because lies a value. In fact, it is the necessity of choosing that defines character in both the story sense and the moral sense. Character is values in action, not simply values believed. Character is defined by values in action, not simply values believed. And stories teach us that character is more important than personality, or good looks, or financial success, or prestige, or any of the things that we normally use to define success, maybe especially in America. This is why we need good stories, individually and collectively. Good stories teach us to act in ways that bring healing to the individual and to the community. All five of these aspects of story can be found in Amy's story about the three candles. Hers is a story that grows out of life and has the power to shape us. It is one that engages all of us, intellect, emotions, spirit, body. It makes connections between things, not the least the connection between two human beings separated by race, nationality, and place in life. It is a story that creates a community between Amy and that South African girl, and now because we have heard it between both of them and us. And it is a story that encourages us to act. It challenges us to do something in the world to make it a place where 18-year-old girls do not lose their husbands and their babies and themselves to AIDS, or to hunger, or to violence, or to all the other things that destroy shalom in the world. And lastly, this story gives us some direction as it guides us in what to do. It suggests that we must do more than write a check. It suggests we need to squat down beside the wall 
and ask people their story and then tell that story to the larger world. Amy alludes to, but does not directly declare, an important additional fact in this story. Amy also has AIDS. When she is telling the story of the African girl, she is telling her own story too. And that is important to remember as we tell the stories of the poor and the oppressed and the victims of injustice in the world. In telling any human story, we are telling our own story. We are not the people who have it all together, who go out to save the world. We are also broken people. When we tell the story of someone else, we enlarge and bring healing to our own. The Native American storyteller Roy Henry says, storytelling is the ointment of the healer. Storytelling is the ointment of the healer. A good story is a balm, and it heals the teller as well as the one who hears. Stories can heal, but they bring within them bring with them a responsibility. If you have a life experience that can benefit someone else, it is your responsibility to tell the story. I'll finish with the words of the writer Patricia Hampel. For we do not, after all, simply have experience. We are entrusted with it. We must do something, make something with it. A story, we sense, is the only possible habitation for the burden of our witnessing. Thank you. <laughs>